Hello everyone and welcome to the Library of Congress. My name is Dr. Kimberly Bug and I'm Chief of the Researcher and Reference Services Division. And today we are excited to, walk, to welcome Dr. Elizabeth Engel uh, to present her research. And we are especially excited because we know she has made extensive contributions and done a lot of her research here at the Library of Congress. So it's always good to be able to match the efforts of those we support in the reading rooms with um, the projects that they um, then accomplish from that effort. You will be surprised to know that the Library of Congress has over 8 million German language texts in the collection, and we have numerous specialists who are available to help support um, using those resources, including Med Met. Kath, um, who put this presentation together today and is always looking for great ways to highlight both the collection, um, as you can see in the back of the room, so stop by and visit, and those who use it. So now I'm going to tell you a little bit more about Dr. Engel. She's an historian of North America in the modern area, in the modern era, specializing in colonial and racial entanglements and the history of risk and uncertainty in the Atlantic world. After receiving her PhD in modern history in January 2014, she joined the German Historical Institute as a research fellow. Her first monograph, Encountering Empire, African American Missionaries in Colonial Africa, 1900 to 1939, was awarded the Franz Steiner Prize for Outstanding Manuscripts in the History of Transatlantic, Transatlantic Relations. Currently, she is working on her second book project in which she traces how notions of risk were constructed and inscribed into the everyday routines of the American population in the American Revolutionary Era. This brings us to the topic of her lecture today, Risk Capital, Fictitious Finance, and the Risk of the Insurance Business in the Age of the American Founding. So with no further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Engel. Thank you so much for this kind introduction, and thank you also for this fabulous invitation. I can only second what you just said. It's really exciting for me as a historian who has used the collection, the Library of Congress, a lot already during my PhD um, to be here now again and to talk about what I find out. And um, the venue is fantastic, I think. Nobody uh, can find a more popular place to speak at. Um, in the discipline of historical research. I'd also like to welcome all of you, and I thank you for spending your lunch break with me and my somewhat bulky topic, <laughs> capital finance and insurance in the late 18th century US. And it is my goal to make this as ex um, exciting and insightful to you in the next about 30 minutes, as it has been for me in my research in the past couple of years. Um, I will present today part of a research project that is supposed to end up as a monograph, my second book, uh, which is tentatively titled States of Uncertainty, Risk and Insurance in the Age of the Emerging American Nation. Uh, this book examines the beginnings of insurance in North America from its first tender steps in the revolutionary era to its rapid rise in the early republic. Uh, when it became also one of the major insurance industries in the world. So we see here a development in which an initially peripheral industry at the margins of European empires uh, turns into a globally dominating one, setting uh, standards, new standards for how insurance is conducted the world over. The curiosity that informs this research project is to understand <laughs> the power of uncertainty as a driving force in history. So I wonder how did feelings of being out of control, of not knowing for certain, of being precarious, feeling unsafe or insecure, shape people's thoughts and action. The practice of insuring has, since its emergence in medieval Europe, played a central role in both describing and coping with these kinds of issues. And it has done so basically by introducing risk as a way of thinking about the possibility of an unwanted future. Um, and it has also offered insurance policies as a new tool <laughs> for people to protect themselves from the hardships they envisioned. 
So ever since, RISC had a remarkable global career and it is used today in colloquial language and in cultures all over the world to capture exactly this sense of having some kind of agency in managing the unknowns of the future, of being able to predict and avert detrimental events. And closely related to this is a second meaning of the term, which we are all <laughs> familiar with also, um, and that describes the possibility of taking risks proactively in expectation of a future gain, akin to gambling. So um, I think a good like, colloquial expression for this is no risk, no fun. So in my talk today, I want to explore a particular aspect of the rise of risk reckoning in the modern era by focusing on the financial dimensions of the nascent insurance business in North America. As I shall argue, insurers began their business in the late 18th century by inventing risk capital as the financial basis of their funds, as opposed to actually raising these funds for having them at their disposal. So my claim here is, accordingly, that the finances upon which the business was founded were essentially fictitious. And as I hope to show in my following argument, insurers constructed this financial fi uh, fiction knowingly and very carefully. Risk capital thus may be understood as an approach to fundraising that characterized the insurance business in particular, but at the same time, it also allows us to understand the role of fictions in the history of capitalism on a much broader scale. So I'd like to begin by giving you a brief uh, introduction to insurance and the problem of capital in the age of the American founding, and then look at the initial funds of the business through the images that contemporaries developed to imagine their capital. And these fictions are, first, um, so-called capital at hazard, um, which was yeah, laid out in abstract sort of quasi-scientific descriptions of what could happen in the future and what the financial value of that was. And the second is subscribed capital, which referred to the idea that members of an insurance company that was to be founded in the future promised to pay a certain share of the predicted losses. Um, and these, fict these two fictions uh, basically define the nature of insurance capital before the capital was actually in existence. Um, so let's begin with a brief survey of the early development of the insurance business in, uh, on North American soil. It is basically important to understand that during the colonial era, there was no insurance company on the North American continent. There exist a handful of exceptions. Um, those were annuity funds that were established by various churches to provide for their priests, widows, and orphans, mainly because um, the churches had difficulty to interest staff to do work um, in America because it was unknown and dangerous and they had to offer some kind of security to these people to come here. Um, those initiatives date back to the 1720s in Philadelphia. There were two annuity funds and then there was another one in Boston in the 1760s. In addition to annuity funds, there were two known attempts to form fire insurance funds. Uh, one of these initiatives took place in 1735 in Charleston. Uh, however, it did not uh, uh, survive the first conflagration there <laughs> a few years later, so then um, fire insurance was off the table. Uh, and the second initiative to provide fire insurance to Americans was the founding of the, what you might have heard of, Philadelphia Contribution Ship for the insurance of houses from loss by fire uh, in 1752, and that one was founded by, um, famously, uh, by Benjamin Franklin was the first um, successful and continuously operating to the present day insurance company in um, North America and then later on the United States. Um, in addition to these very few options, Americans had access only to marine insurance, which was issued in the colonial Atlantic world primarily by big trading companies in London, such as the Lloyds. Underwriting maritime risk was a crucial factor in stabilizing British mercantile system, especially the triangular trade involving the slave trade in the Atlantic world. The very limited insurance options that were available to settlers in British North America rapidly expanded at the onset of the American Revolution. So I really think it's 
underestimate an unknown aspect of the Revolutionary War is the, the, the struggle for financial independence, we can say. Um, so in this map, I've tried to trace the development of the business uh, before and after the ratification of um, the American institution, uh, Constitution in 1789 by using two different colors. <laughs> so the red dots are companies founded before 1789, and the blue ones are um, companies founded after that until the end of the early republic in the 1830s. And um, so you see there was like a handful of companies before and after that. So the number from what I've counted um, expands to 300 companies coming into existence in this time period, and they also achieve sort of a nationwide distribution. So by the 1830s, all of the then 26 federal states have at least one insurance company. These businesses encompassed um, fire, marine, and life insurance companies. However, in most cases, these distinctions did not strictly apply. Um, rather, marine insurers would insure um, the life of crew members, for instance, fire insurance insures ships in the harbor. Um, life insurance policies, uh, uh, policies were often used as a security to obtain credit, for instance, or um, to start business relationships. To give an example, a marine insurance company in Massachusetts described its risk portfolio in 1800 as encompassing, I quote, vessels, freight and goods, captivity of persons, the life of any person during his absence by sea, and money lent upon bottomry. So you see, has, insurance takes on a, a multiplicity of functions. For us now, important to note, at the core of each of these companies stood a fund. This fund was the respective risk capital, a fund for the purpose of indemnifying losses and damages. The value of the risk capital was determined by the individual companies and could vary in the age of the American founding from values as low as 20,000 US dollars to values of several million US dollars. So the highest one that I have come across was 3 million US dollars. Most common were amounts, and that's what we see here, what you probably also see by the nice exhibit in the back, um, um, around, like of several hundred thousands US um, dollars. So we can see this here, for instance, in this, can you read this? Yeah. Um, in this list of insurance companies in New York City from 1814, published in the American Almanac, um, there were in total, there were 12 insurance funds and I think 10 out of them had a capital of a half a million. And we can also see um, that the insurance companies, so the companies that are listed here are called United Insurance Company, New York Insurance Company, Mutual Insurance Company. We see all of them have half a million capital in dollars. What we cannot tell is are they fire, life or marine insurance. So even in the public presentation, the capital was more important than the actual specification or like field that they were working in. Historians have recently begun to pay attention to this capital. Estimates have it that its cumulative uh, value amounted by 1815 to approximately 36 million US dollar. This amount indicates that early American insurers were as influential in the political economy as banks which received most of the political attention, especially, you know, the fights about the um, Bank of North America, the first bank of the United States. There were as many insurance companies as banks, and they had as much capital as banks. So even though insurers operated kind of in the backgrounds, their funds prompt us to consider them as crucial actors in providing and economizing capital for the domestic economy, and thus as trailblazers in the establishment of financial capitalism as a new business branch in the United States. In addition to their central role in the early American economy, insurers provided a major source of funding for the fragile American state. Insurers invested their capital on the domestic financial market so that it became available for political authorities that financed the construction of critical infrastructures of uh, transportation and communication in the federal states with insurance money. And invested insurance money also helped liquidating the federal government. 
by buying the funded debt of the United States, as it was called, or stock of the United States Bank, which served to redeem international debt of the Revolutionary War. Long story short, insurance money was extremely important for the economy and for um, the state in the age of the American founding. So in light of the enormous economic and political influence and unnoticed <laughs> influence, we may say, of insurance money, the question at hand is, how did insurers get this money? This question currently <laughs> puzzles historians, and it will also puzzle us for the next part of this presentation. In the age of the American founding, capital was arguably difficult to obtain, as the economy and the state were financially strained by the revolution. Merchants and plantation owners who produced the American staples were cut off from the colonial trade and um, had less access to international credit. Thus, um, moved into sort of a generally more precarious situation. So insurers had no option to thrive on investments from abroad, while at the same time options to find wealthy domestic investors were also very limited. In addition, insurers faced the peculiar problems that they were basically unknown to the general public, and if they were known, <laughs> they had a rather bad reputation, as insurance was associated with gambling and all kinds of um, immoral and not so good financial businesses. So the American population did not respond positively to these offers. And we can see that researchers have looked into what the actual revenue was that insurers made from selling insurance policies it was almost nothing until the 1830s. That was not a source of income. So all this basically underscores that the question is where where did they get the money from? So against this backdrop, I suggest examining a set of documents in which insurers explained how they planned to raise money for their purposes nonetheless. These explanations can be found in what insurers called plans, which laid out the relationship between risk and the size of the funds that, they were, that were needed to cover them, and articles of association, or like similarly named founding documents, in which associated individuals developed rules and regulations for raising and managing insurance money. Both of these types of sources were typically shared with specific target groups, um, usually called subscribers, um, and insurers hoped that the subscribers would buy their funding schemes and um, yeah, extend promises to pay small contributions to bring a fund of the respective size into existence. These documents, I think, serve to think about capital as a fiction in two ways. First, they literally describe visions of the procedure in which capital, risk capital, was to be built. Um, that means plans and articles of association do not tell us how much capital there was or what was actually in the fund, but they tell us how insurers were thinking about bringing it into the fund. And second, the descriptions of the procedures of building risk capital help us understand the extent to which insurance funds were meant to be fictitious. That is, insurers proposed explicitly that the funds did not have to be actually created in ready money. <laughs> so in the sense, they resemble what Naomi Lamoureux has called fictitious capital. And um, she, has ref she, she uses the term to refer to a practice that was common among banks. It's called insider lending. So one bank is loaning the other bank, and the other bank is loaning in return. None of them had money, and all of a sudden both have a loan. So this is kind of the logic we are looking for here now. So let's start by looking into what insurers meant by capital. Insurance capital was distinguished from traditional forms of capital in the US which was mostly land or cash. The value of land and cash was tied to the value of a material asset. Land, obviously, cash was tied to gold or silver or some other uh, material um, value. The capital insurers proposed to build consisted um, of an immaterial asset. It was tied to the value of potential future loss. So whatever could be lost, could be turned into capital at hazard in the logic of insurance thinking. <clears throat> Conveying this way of thinking was a key task for insurers in the revolutionary era. Indeed, the intellectual exercise of determining the value of future damages or losses 
shaped an own genre of insurance publications, geared to make the interested public understand the new financial reasoning. The oldest known publication of this kind is a plan published by Gordon William in Boston in 1772, two years after the Boston Massacre. I think it's really remarkable that it started um, <clears throat> so early. So here you see the cover page. The plan was titled The Plan of <clears throat> a Society for Making Provisions for Widows by Annuities for the Remainder of Life and for granting annuities to persons after certain ages with the proper tables for calculating what must be paid by the several members in order to secure the set advantages. <laughs> kind of long title, but it was, uh, it was a remarkable <laughs> intervention that uh, Gordon William was a priest, by the way. So um, as a first example of an insurance plan published on North American soil, this one gives us an idea of the central features of these documents. The plans define a purpose of the fund. Um, here it's the risk of poverty for married women. Uh, or old age poverty, and they presented procedures for calculating how much averting this risk would cost uh, in total, as well as uh, procedures for calculating how much money individuals would have to put down to bring together a fund of the size that would kind of cover their individual risks. Um, and we see this here in particular because he already stresses in the, in the, uh, in the title that he's also going to deliver the proper tables, which continue the pricing scheme that is appropriate. Um, plans like this circulated in the 13 founding colonies and beyond, and they treated also fire and marine insurance. To illustrate the reasoning behind the idea, of uh, capital at hazard, I would like to show you one of the earliest fire insurance plans. You gotta focus, you have to wake up again. We are going through the mass now. So this plan was published in 1797, also in Boston. The authors of the plan were Alicia Ticknor and Nathan Bond, two merchants who engaged in philanthropic activities in Boston a lot, as was typical at the time, so they invested but wealthy merchants invested in a project of public utility. Bond and Tickner presented their plan in the following, uh, presented the following calculation in their plan. They estimated, and as you see, there's like no further explanation given why this is so. so they just put down uh, a calculation. So they said um, there's a total of 4,500 buildings in Boston. And by buildings, they understand mansions, stores, and other buildings. This combination kind of shows us that they had wealthy elites in mind who had fancy real estate, but they were also thinking of sort of shop owners or like commercial people basically opened the idea up to the general public by saying, and there can also be other buildings. Um, in the plan, Bond and Techno make their considerations explicitly hypothetical by using terms like supposed to be in Boston or uh, should be uh, insured in this company. This gives room for their calculation of the, fu the fund they are seeking to bring together. They assume that each building can be considered to have a value of 1,600 US dollars and that the company would insure 1,500 buildings in total. Thus, the capital at hazard amounts to 2.4 million. <laughs> yeah, is pretty easy actually. So as they say, 2.4 million dollars being then at hazard, adequate funds are to be thought. Like in this example, insurers made more or less vague and ungrounded claims about how much value their funds should have. In fact, the plan here is making a quite transparent effort to determine the size of the fund. Many others, I mean, usually is really not as elaborate. They just state the capital of the company XYZ shall amount to half a million US dollar. And um, importantly, um, this formula was essential, um, essentially how new capital was made. So it, it didn't take much more than just explaining that this is the value of the fund. The second step, as Bond and Tickner indicate, is to seek adequate funds, to seek funds of that size. By this, insurers meant the procedure of collecting subscriptions from people who were interested in forming the fund and thus also the company that would manage the fund. These subscriptions were a promise of paying 
a certain sum. One, once enough people had subscribed to bring a fund of the proposed size into existence. It's basically um, also used in, uh, in the book printing business. You make sure that enough people are interested in buying the book before you actually print it and then you print it to the extent that people were interested. Um, <clears throat> um, in the age of the American founding, there were two strategies for breaking the desired fund down into small contributions, into subscriptions. One uh, was to just like sort of cut it into sh shares of the same price. Um, the Articles of Association would read then the capital stock of the company, I think I have an example of the Providence Insurance Company here, so uh, the, the capital stock of the uh, Providence Insurance Company shall be $150,000 to be divided into 2,000 shares of $75 each. Pretty straightforward. The other strategy was calculating individual contributions based, for instance, on the age of the contributing member, if it was an annuity fund, or um, on the hazards of the building members were trying to insure. So a sugar refiner would have to pay more than a farm owner whose farm is next by the river. Regardless of the pricing of the contributions, insurers offered that members paid their contribution in several installments and that they could use various types of payments in each installment. Typically, insurers required that shareholders only pay 10% of the contribution in cash right away. The remaining 90% of whatever the amount was that they had to contribute could be made in the course of several years after, ranging from two to nine years. I've really seen extensive like time spans that people had to actually make their payment. And in addition, they could make it uh, not in cash, but in so what is called sometimes promissionary note, which is basically saying, okay, I'm going to pay you in six months from now, or bank notes or other certificates um, bearing interest or securities. Um, so basically, it comes down to saying, okay, you do not really have to you do not really have to pay for your contribution in this fund. Um, so a payment, paying in permissionary notes in particular, obviously is a way to postpone the actual payment to a much later date. So even if the shares in the joint stock insurers offered for sale, they weren't very expensive. So 75 is kind of high, they were like $50, $20. It's money, but it's not like really a huge sum for, for most people. The installments gave room for a different calculation. As articles of association made clear, insurers planned to pay out dividends from the profits they made from investing the fund. Typically two times per year, so every six months, the person who put down the cash payment can expect to be paid out from the fund, whatever um, the fund made in, uh, in profits, capital gain, this basically opened up the possibilities that members did not ever have to complete the outstanding payments, as the fund would general capital gain to cover the costs of their future installments. This reasoning reveals that apart from the first payment in cash, insurers intended to work with fictitious capital. They traded promises for interest by investing their not yet existing funds on the financial market. So, to conclude, in this presentation I have looked into late 18th century finance from the perspective of American insurers. Insurers proposed in this era to make a new form of capital available, which was determined by the value of future risks of poverty caused by old age, death, or loss of property and fire. Insurers defined this capital as emerging from two calculations. One calculation was estimating the total insurable loss or damage, which allowed people to understand the size of the fund they had to put together to be safe from these hardships. The second calculation was to break down the total loss into small contributions. Ah, sorry. <laughs> um, which made up for a fund that was invested and thus paid back outstanding contributions from capital gain. 
that is money that was made from the use of money. Thus, financing an insurance fund was presented as not requiring any financial exertions. A promise to pay in the future was enough to make the payback happen. And once it exceeded outstanding contributions, the funds created financial security also beyond the event some actual hardship or mischief was happening. They brought the insured money regularly from dividends. Risk and profits from money were popular forms of capital in the era of the American founding. We can see this just like from how much the insurance company is starting off. The, these risk and profits could be owned by rich and poor segments of the revolutionary society as insurance could be obtained for a negligibly small contribution. Yet the assets they bought were ultimately fictitious. Risk and its financial profits described assumptions about what could happen in the future. Thank you very much for your attention. And we have now, <laughs> we have now time for a Q&A, if you like. Yes. What, oh, it's, Yes, um, the, the, it's a very good question. I think there are like two answers to this. Typically, the insurance company doesn't pay. They find a way to say, uh, the, the main interest is my impression from like just like reading hundreds of these documents. It's like, they are not really interested in indemnifying, you know, the events. They really want to keep the fund together and invest it. That's the main interest. But it has happened, as I mentioned, the very first one is already an example of this where um, a conflagration occurred. So the fire insurance fund, it was just not big enough and they went bankrupt. However, I see in the later documents here, they always have, even as joint stock companies in the bad sense, like where actually there was like separate gain for the shareholders, or the mutual companies which were saying, we want to divide up the profits and the capital gain in the most equal terms among everybody. They all have an, like an additional clause that says, if that happens, if there is a case of loss or damage that exceeds what we have in the fund, people have to pay, make additional payments ad hoc, which is basically just another way to say, okay, we kind of see how far we get along, you know, with the fictitious element of this. We have like some kind of fund and we can invest it. And if something actually happens, we will build a real fund where we can indemnify losses. <laughs> but, it, but I do not know um, that there were many cases where this actually happened. You would probably have to look through the... Um, the books, you know, to see. I know they have, they had like tables where they were listing the risks they had taken and that was added up so they had sort of an idea of what the amount was that they potentially would have to come up with if there was like cases of losses. But I, I don't think, I don't think in, as in general the, the business was not very stable, we can say that, it was experimental and you can also tell from what they were insuring, you know, like death from drinking gin or like all kinds of things. It was really like a, yeah, like a financial experiment period. But yeah, thank you for this wonderful question. So dealing with fictitious money reminds me of financial bubbles that exist when you deal with money that isn't real and that people buy into. So I know your research focused on the time period of the revolutionary era up to 1830, but I'm wondering if this boom of insurance companies created a bubble of sorts that maybe popped or expanded <laughs> later on. Yeah, good. Um, it's a good question, yeah. Um, no. The, uh, yeah, no. The, interestingly enough, insurance companies seem to be a lot more trustworthy than banks, who do essentially, they do essentially the exact same thing. Like even what they invest in or what they pay out, they sell shares, stock, on the stock market, but insurance companies seem more trustworthy. And they do not have, they do not have like these runs that banks have, and then banks collapse, so they might have been actually really more stable. Um, so I 
don't, I mean, it would, it is actually a good research question. I'm not sure that anybody, no, because you know, in this era, there, were, there was like one panic after the other, and it would be interesting to see how insurance companies played into this. But I, um, I would say from what I've seen that the general sense for people was that, that, that this is actually is a good, safe way to let your money work for yourself, um, and better than banks, because banks had a, you know, they were just like not very popular. And, um, and didn't have yeah, as much trust or credibility <coughs> as insurance companies. Yes. Sehr gut. <laughs> Wir können auch Deutsch sprechen. Vielen Dank. <laughs> Gerne. Uh, ich habe eine Frage. Uh -huh. oh, okay, so uh, in English. Um, now I'm, I'm interested in what, in an earlier era, uh, uh, the questioner there was interested in what happened a little bit later. Um, how did this relate to uh, the famous uh, joint stock companies like Dutch East Indies? And of course, mm -hmm. there was one in France and one in Sweden, uh, uh, the Hudson Bay Company and so on. Yeah. So I guess the subscribers there were wealthier than more people, but they were still insuring against loss and mm -hmm. uh, they had limited liability. How does that relate to yeah. your topic? I think that the, the model that you're referring to, so the joint stock company is in use very long among British merchants, but also like if let's say colonial empires do use this to limit the um, yeah, person, private liability and like basically spread out the risk. Uh, but engaging in a business operation, when you do it as a joint stock company, you pool capital together, and then you kind of also share the gain that is made, but it also means you just don't lose everything. It's not like a one-person um, enterprise. That was exactly used for the, for the uh, I think the um, East India trading company was like one of the first big stock companies. And the British Crown, I don't know for, for other empires, the British Crown had, in 1720, there was the South Sea uh, bubble. And after that, they um, released the Bubble Act, which basically said, okay, nobody is running any kind of joint stock company um, except the British Crown itself. That is one reason why Americans couldn't found insurance funds, because the, the basically use of private investment into some kind of business enterprise was prohibited. So um, it is a model that I think insurers do absolutely, they are absolutely eager to pursue. And even if it's like sometimes cloaked as, like with this mutual company thing, it is essentially the same. I would say it is what they do is build joint stock companies because depending on how much you contribute, let's say how many shares you buy in the stock, you have, you know, you get rights for, like how much you have a say in, the, in managing the company, what losses get indemnified, or who is like admitted to join. So there is, it is the whole same. It, I, I say it's the identical, it's the identical setup. It's just called differently. <laughs> it's, it's my analysis, yeah. <clears throat> uh, related to that question, uh, at the time you're uh, talking about here, Mm -hmm. um, marine insurance had existed as a business for several centuries. Yes. And a pretty successful business, and, and marine uh, insurance partnerships actually paid claims, unlike, apparently, the insurance companies you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Why was that not taken uh, as a model for... Uh, the marine insurance? insurance? Yeah. Um, so marine insurance had... Eventually, they had companies... But mostly it was bilateral contracts among merchants. So merchants had a very, I think, a very closely knit community across the Atlantic world. They had expertise about the ocean, about the problems that occurred there. And typically they went, there were these coffee houses, also like in London, but they were also in Philadelphia and in Boston. And they went there and they were checking out which ships were going where, with what freight. And then they would just approach the person individually and do that it was called underwriting so two people make a contract with each other saying okay you pay me now you pay me some kind of premium and if something happens i'm going to indemnify the loss 
of the ship or the freight or whatever. And um, as companies, I think marine insurance becomes relevant, but in out of the, the whole business, when you look at the whole American business after the revolution, it's the smallest share. It becomes relevant when it takes on the joint stock company form because then it opens up the possibility to go onto the financial market to, to get capital gain. I would say that this is why Americans are interested in founding marine insurance because otherwise you're right, it's, it's well established and um, there are networks and locations and you know experts of this business who have basically a lot of um, experience. It's not um, actuarial science behind it, but really just like, okay, we know how this works and we have our contacts, we have brokers who would like make sure that people find, um, build bigger groups if they wanna, you know, share, insure a ship together um, in three parts or something like that. So that would be my, um, would be my guess. I think insurance, um, marine insurance is <coughs> important and it stays important. It's just a slightly different community behind it and a very, very long tradition that I don't think is very damaged by the rise of all these new companies in the early republic. <coughs> and it's used also by, by American companies when they found companies and it really in a strict sense of pulling together a group, a society of people who are then managing a fund which um, underwriting does not necessarily have. It's like a private, like a one person investment into the insurance of a particular passage. On, on your map that you showed, you had the red dots and the blue dots, and yes. uh, the blue dots were post-American uh, Revolution, heavily concentrated in New England. Mm -hmm. Wondered if you have some thoughts as to why they were so heavily concentrated there. Yeah, um, so to, he's putting me on the spot. <laughs> the map that you see is from 1851. It's not really from the era, and as you might know, maps from the era is kind of very difficult to make. So we have, initially we have the 13 founding colonies, right? So that's where most of the insurance business is concentrated. That is because it is related to urban environment and ports and trade. So um, as like this, you, the societies have to achieve a certain affluence to have this concern of needing insurance and also being able to basically provide it, have something to spare that they can put down in the fund. So there are like these very, very basic developments um, that are concentrated in the 13 founding colonies, in particular in, uh, in New York, in Boston, in Philadelphia, which are reaching the same uh, number of inhabitants at the time, like be forming the big metropoles of the United States, it's about 15,000 people. <laughs> it's not a lot. All other areas, the, the density of the population is very low and we do not have as many urban environments. That it does change rapidly though in the era. And you know, in, like by 1815 there are 18 um, American states, but it's very difficult to say because you know, there's the westward expansion and the Louisiana purchase and like, this is basically in flux. So what happens on the west, what we see a little bit here on the map is that is following um, the, like, going the, the, the north path around the Appalachian Mountains. That's kind of a natural border that, um, you know, the, the American population does not, it takes a while for it to cross the Appalachian Mountains, but going um, in the north through the Ohio Valley, um, there's a river, and you know that's like the, the area that becomes soon accessible. Also land speculation in Ohio is going on, and that's when insurance companies um, follow. But the main, yes, you can, I'm, I have a different map where you can, you can see how, like, how many numbers, like how many insurance companies were in which city, and it's like, I think, 51 in New York City, 48 in Boston, and then, you know, one and two in other uh, smaller urban settlements, and mainly ports, yeah, port cities. Charleston is an early center, too. We kind of see this here a little bit in the map. It's a big sugar harbor. So that's typically where, where these developments intersect, that it takes to create 
the need, enough money, but also the need for insurance. Did you have a question or? Yeah. <laughs> That's a good. It's a good question. So the prof professionalization of the business. Um, I would, it, so typically in the literature, it's the 1840s. That's when auctuary science um, kicks in. The, the early American insurers, basically, the government, the federal government, two, two times turns down suggestions to run an insurance company on a, on a state level. Annuity and fire is proposed. People really, really want the state to get into this. But the state says, no, we don't have the expertise. So there is this idea that you need mathematicians, you need to have certain data available to be able to run a fire or an annuity scheme or whatever life insurance company. And that um, development starts in the 1840s. In the 1840s you have people coming from Europe, experts <laughs> coming over who do, who do the math, you know, who, who do collect information how big is the population of the United States? How do all these differences figure in that we have? You have Native Americans, you have enslaved populations. It's like completely different from what, you, what the knowledge basis is um, in England. Typically you have like a few, like churches by accident collect some kind of data on how long people live, you know, how old they get, how this varies between gender, but it's highly unclear and in early insurance, Insurers really talk about this. They say, oh, <laughs> we actually, we don't know, but the idea is we also don't have to care if there's only just enough people joining and we can achieve this by keeping the contributions low. The fund will be big enough and it will be safe. This is a little bit, it's like a, like a rule of thumb and they convincingly put it out. So there is like this, I don't know, there is like this mania or enthusiasm about um, insurance companies. And the, yes, so I, for life insurance and fire insurance, it's not until the 1840s that there is actually what we would expect some kind of statistical analysis or basis. And then also, you know, the, the environment and the, the country is so big and it expands all the time. There's a big discussion about California risks eventually, you know, when the settlements reach the West Coast, it's like, ah, we have no idea what the health conditions are of people over there. So it takes, it takes a while for that to be established. Um, commercial insurance, you mean? Insurance of businesses. Um, Mm -hmm. um, I, I would, I would, um, so my answer to this would be that my impression is, especially fire insurance, which is the biggest part of the, the whole business that emerges in the time, is some kind of industrial insurance, what is called industrial insurance later on. So people try to insure actually high risk industries because the normal exclusions are, as I mentioned, <coughs> sugar refineries, distilleries, <coughs> all kinds of like industries. Industries that work with fire do not get fire insurance. So you have sort of a run um, among people who are labeled as working in dangerous industries. And indus like industrialization, of course, also starts in this era. It becomes more and more important as a source of income. So insurance for this becomes very important. And um, in many of these, early fire insurance companies, I would say basically it's, a, it's, it's formed among bakers when you look into it. They do, not call, they do not call it, but you can see there's like a, a particular profession or like somebody who is considered a very hazardous occupant or uh, having a very hazardous yeah, profession, then they draw together and, and ensure themselves amongst each other. Good. You're getting insurance now? <laughs>
I don't know what time it is. Are we... Um, time? Okay. Okay. Um, thank you so much. It was really great. <laughs>